Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to this webinar on data inclusivity and a couple of very interesting studies uh, we'll hear a little bit more about today. Uh, I'm Anthony Radich, the Executive Director of WestF, the Western States Arts Federation. And we are an organization interested in using data and using research and studies to improve our field. We work primarily with state arts agencies, but we actually have quite a bit of activity in the area of art and technology. Uh, this webinar is, was prompted by our work in an area called the Creative Vitality Suite. That is a dashboard uh, that really combines many, many streams of national data about the creative economy into a workable online tool that you can interact with. And the tool includes uh, occupations of the creative economy, nonprofit data, uh, commercial data. Uh, it's really a wealth of information, all tracked from uh, credible national data sources. Because there are always some levels of confusion about how our work of data and the Creative Vitality Suite in particular fits into other data efforts, let me just talk briefly about a couple others before we go on to our guest today. Um, our study is, our work is not the art and economic prosperity uh, data that is released by Americans for the Arts. Uh, that nationwide work, it comes out once every five years. You all may have seen something in the papers recently about it. They always do a lot of good press around it. Uh, again, once every five years, the data comes out. It's based on work with 250 self-administered uh, surveys uh, that are the results of which are then imputed to the nation. So really very different kind of data. Uh, also, we often get confused with data arts. Data arts is another fine effort, and their work really seeks to uh, collect information from grant seekers uh, who are applying to grant makers who are a part of the data arts network. Uh, the entire country is not covered by that network, but what that data arts project does do is collect in detail for those who do, in a self-administered way, uh, present data on employment, uh, admissions, attendance, or whatever, provide some highly in-depth detail on the nonprofit arts activity in a nonprofit arts organization only, not creative economy. Uh, that is regularly updated. So those are two things I just wanted to bring to mind uh, that are regularly confused. And with that, let me introduce Frances Quinreuter who is our first guest. I'm not going to introduce her at length because we have been bombarding you with information about these two guests. And I want to hear from her instead of taking a few minutes to introduce her because we have a limited amount of time. But before she comes on, let me also suggest we have an opportunity for you to all to ask questions at the end of this series. And we look forward to answering questions you might have. Um, I will ask a few questions after each of the presenters. We'll hear from Francis, then we'll hear from Salvador Acevedo, and then just a very brief update on some new data in the Creative Vitality Suite we have available uh, on the same subject, and then questions. So let's turn to Francis. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's really great to be here, and um, I'm excited to present about our survey um, called Race to Lead, Confronting the Nonprofit Racial Leadership Gap. So should I just jump right in? Absolutely. That would be great. Um, so. Uh, about three years ago, the Building Movement Project, which had done a lot of work on generational shifts in leadership in the nonprofit sector, started to think about whether we should sunset that work. And we were in a meeting of our uh, project team from around the country, and one of our leaders said, you know, it's interesting. Uh, she is a leader of color. She said, in my area of the country, even though we're a majority people of color, we're seeing more white leadership and fewer leaders of color. And we thought, oh, that's interesting. And then our team member for Detroit uh, chimed in and said she was seeing the same thing. And that really started us on this journey where we thought, why um, aren't there more leaders of color in the nonprofit sector? So we did a literature review like many people did, and we uh, interviewed about 36 informants, influencers, uh, race equity trainers, executive directors, funders, uh, really trying to figure out what they thought the problem was. Because as it turns out, 
the number, the percent of people of color running nonprofit organizations really hasn't changed for the last 25 years, and it's under 20% of the total sector. So our question is, why, despite the fact that we have an increased number of training programs for developing leaders of color, um, why haven't those numbers changed? Um, so actually, after doing the literature review and, and doing these interviews, we thought, let's do a survey. And we were really hoping that we could get 2,000 people to answer this survey that was sent out to any staffers of a nonprofit organization. Uh, but we were really lucky. We got that uh, amount that was released last summer. And, and um, uh, 2,000 people responded within the first couple of weeks. So we knew that there was some interest out there. And by the time we closed the survey, over 4,000 people had answered the survey. So why don't I get into some of the results. First of all, who took the survey? We, uh, we have 15 distribution partners uh, from the National Council of La Raza to the um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, large membership organizations um, of arts groups, uh, of service providers uh, all around the country. And um, we were especially targeting people of color. We called the uh, survey Nonprofits, Leadership, and Race. And 42% 42 42 of the respondents were people of color. If you look at the breakdown of who answered the survey, 15% were African American, 8% Asian American Pacific Islanders, 11% Latino, Latina, or as some people say, Latinx. 1% uh, Native American, and then we had an 8% multiracial category. What's interesting about those numbers is if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the National Bureau of Labor Statistics, they actually break down um, sectors of work, and one of those sectors is the charitable sector. And our numbers almost exactly parallel what they report as who is in the workforce, uh, the race breakdown, except they don't have a multiracial category. Um, about 78% of the uh, respondents were women. Um, that actually also uh, parallels the Bureau of Labor Statistics data. 20% uh, were LGBTQ. And in terms of age, about um, a little over a third were millennials and, and Gen X. They were almost 40%, both of those, and then the rest, uh, rest were boomers. Again, very similar to the BLS data. So what we found is the story that we've been telling ourselves about the problem really isn't the problem. Uh, first of all, people of color are just as qualified as white respondents in the survey. Um, if you look at the data, they have very similar educational backgrounds, a little a fewer master's degrees by people of color, but more people of color had what we call terminal degrees, PhDs, JDs, MDs. Um, people of color were just as experienced as white respondents. Uh, if you look at their positions in terms of uh, uh, in the organization, whether they were senior management or middle managers or line staff, they had the same number of years in the sector, uh, so they had similar experiences, and actually their salaries weren't even very different. Uh, so the, one of the, the, the assumptions is what people of color needed more training to be leaders, and that was not true in our data. And the other assumption that we heard from people is that, well, people of color don't aspire to be leaders. But actually, our data shows that people of color aspire more uh, to leadership positions in the nonprofit sector than white respondents, 10% more. And actually, there was a study about, I think it was 2006 that was released that showed similar data. It was kind of buried in a larger study of uh, younger leaders. So this isn't new data. We just haven't paid attention um, to it before. So if it's not people's background, if it's not um, people's experience, if it's not a people of color's willingness to lead organizations, then what's the problem? Why aren't there more leaders of color uh, in nonprofit organizations? And as it turns out, that it's really the systemic barriers that people of color face. Um, we found that uh, the respondents told us that, it, and this was um, both white and people of color respondents, so more people of color, told us that executive recruiters didn't do enough to find a diverse pool of uh, qualified candidates, that white boards don't support the leadership uh, potential of people of color, and also that um, organizations rule out uh, people based on this thing called organizational fit, 
which is like you don't kind of fit our culture in the organization. And I don't know if people here have read about implicit bias, if your listeners have um, know that term, but it's really kind of the unconscious biases that, that rule people out. And, and organizational fit is one of those um, biases. So we also know that it's systemic. The other thing we found is we asked respondents what barriers did they have um, uh, to advancing to leadership? What helped their leadership advancement and what hindered it? And if you ask them like their track record at work, everybody, white people of color say their track record at work, you know, over 90% said helps them advance. Uh, but when we asked about their race and ethnicity, uh, over a third, 35% of people of color said that that had negatively impacted their advancement um, in their organization. So, so what does this mean? Um, well, it doesn't mean that people of color didn't have real needs for support. Uh, as a matter of fact, we asked uh, aspiring leaders what they needed in order to be, to be in leadership roles, and both uh, people of color and white respondents, though more people of color, so they really needed more technical and management skills. Actually, we did a lot of focus groups to find out. We, we, we focus grouped this particular uh, finding, and people of color in the focus groups almost unanimously said, we have to have more technical and management skills because we are going to be under more scrutiny than our white counterparts. And if we don't have the finance training, if we don't have the certificates or degrees that show we can do this work, we're afraid that we won't have an opportunity to fail. Uh, if something goes wrong under our watch, they'll say it's because of, it's our race. We also asked about their challenges and frustrations, and we did find differences between people of color and white respondents, not on the demanding workload, which everybody said they had too much work. That We know that as uh, nonprofit employees. But when we looked at things like uh, relationship with funding sources, uh, role models, social capital, people of color found that they were more challenged and had more need for these, the white respondents. And especially this uh, category called um, being called upon to represent their community. So people of color talked about how they actually had two jobs. We had a lot of write-in responses on this particular answer where they said not only did they have to do their job, especially in leadership, but they also were called upon to be on advisory boards, uh, advise funders, um, do presentations both to the community uh, and to, um, and to funding, uh, in, on funding panels because there were so few people of color that they were called upon over and over again. And unfortunately, they're not compensated for that work. So it's almost like they have two jobs. You might say they have more opportunity, but because they don't have more funding, uh, that means that they end up having to represent community uh, as part of their work as well as do the work of running the organization. Um, and then uh, you can see we have some quotes from people of color. Um, so here's an African-American woman who says, despite my overwhelming positive track record, I've never had a single staff person at any of the three nonprofits I work with take me under their wing as a mentee and try to groom me for a higher position. And I've never had a supervisor of color. So um, we uh, recommend that people uh, start addressing um, more of the systemic bias and racism uh, that we face in our sector, uh, that diversity isn't about just representation, it's really about changing the culture of our organizations, um, and that we that takes us as leaders to change that culture, both board leadership and also current leadership. What does it mean to shift power, to give new people uh, power and position, and that we can measure that change. It's not something hard to measure, and, and I know uh, nonprofits are asked to measure everything, so there's no reason we can't be asked to measure that. So that gives you a summary of the initial findings. Well, thank you, Francis. That's a great summary of a lot of complicated material, and I want to encourage our participants to read the study, which is easily available online. But let me ask you a few questions. Um, sure. Uh, we have – I'm a white, uh, older baby boomer in the business. We have uh, Gen Xers. We have millennials. Uh, how, how do you – how did you find attitudes about inclusiveness varied among those age groups, or did it at all? There wasn't a lot of difference uh, in terms of their attitudes, in terms of their uh, organizational fit, um, the ways that they responded to recruiters. Of course, the aspirations were uh, more uh, Gen Xers and Millennials were aspiring to leadership than Boomers. I think that makes sense because the Boomers uh, are already in their position. It's interesting that more uh, – 
of white respondents, and I'm just trying to think if it's based on age, Anthony, I can't remember, I'd have to go back and look, uh, said that they, they didn't aspire to leadership roles because they were concerned about work-life balance, whereas more people of color respondents said they didn't aspire to leadership roles because they were going to look for uh, jobs outside the nonprofit sector. So there are some differences that, that might be age-related as well. Okay, okay. And what do you recommend? You know, once you display these findings to board members and people in foundation, community, etc., uh, what, what concrete steps do you suggest they take to change this? Yeah, well, that's a really great question. First of all, you know, uh, to start by just taking an internal inventory. One of the uh, respondents talked about how all the entry-level people were people of color, and as you went up the hierarchy, it became totally white, including the boards of directors. So just what do you look like in your organization? And then given that, how would you start making some changes? So we talk about the difference between representation and inclusivity. So it's very important to have the representation that you want to have more people of color on your board of directors and uh, in your senior level staff, but that happens by making an organization be more inclusive. In other words, what's the culture of the organization? Who's included? How are people excluded? Who has mentors? Who doesn't have mentors? So doing that sort of inventory in the organization is really, really helpful. You can even take some of the questions from the survey and ask it in your organization. What, what do you think you lack? What do you think you uh, need? We've, we've been doing that for some organizations, and I think just getting the data is the first place to start. But I do think it's got to be at a leadership level. We know that uh, the barriers are not uh, uh, you know, personal experience and preparation. So we have to look at what keeps a person of color from being hired. Uh, one of the big issues has been the question about whether people of color can raise money. And I think there's a lot of fear that they're not going to be appealing to white donors. And that's another way that race gets uh, implicitly uh, um, uh, the implicit assumptions about race are very different than what we might say explicitly. Sure, sure. Well, one final question, uh, and that is, uh, what next for your organization in terms of a next study or next action uh, for you and, and your organization around this issue? Well, thanks for asking. Um, what we are going to do, we had over 800 uh, CEOs or executive directors answer the survey. Uh, so we want to go back, and about 40% of those were people of color in this particular survey. We want to go back and find out about their pathways to leadership because we've been hearing and seeing from some other studies that people of color are more likely to be hired if they already work within an organization. Um, and uh, white respondents are more likely to come from outside the organization. And just the type of supports they had or did, did not have as they went into leadership and a little bit about their board composition. So hopefully we can dig in and get some more really practical information out to groups. Well, great. Well, stay with us, and thanks for that nice sharing and uh, summarizing in a very short time, again, a lot of really great material and a really wonderful contribution to the work of many people are really committed to this subject. And speaking of which, uh, people committed to this subject, uh, Salvador Acevedo is a person the West Staff has worked with over the years uh, in our Emerging Leaders of Color program where we identify uh, promising emerging leaders from around the region and bring them together, uh, yes, for technical knowledge development, but also for the development of a network among them because in some parts of the region, uh, the people of color working in the arts are pretty uh, dispersed and pretty lonely out there, and we'd like to build up a network uh, that can support them in their work. So, Salvador, uh, if we could just hear a summary of your latest study, and uh, I'll have a few questions for you, too. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation, uh, and thank you to West Staff for putting together this uh, webinar. I think it's really interesting. So uh, our study that we launched recently is very different from what we just heard from uh, Francis. This study is uh, based on the visitor experience to arts organizations. So what we wanted was to really understand the type of experiences that Latinos in a specific have uh, at arts organizations um, and what are the experiences that they would like to have and that engage them with the arts. And as part of the... Um, the study, we also ask people their perception of art organizations. 
we develop a few hypotheses on what it is uh, that attracts people or makes the difference for uh, Latinos when they engage with arts organizations. And this hypothesis is based on a triangle or three factors. We call this unified engagement. And um, the idea is that over the years, we've seen organizations focusing uh, sometimes on content that would be uh, relevant for Latinos or any other uh, minority population. So uh, we've seen a lot of organizations, for example, developing the uh, Day of the Dead uh, programs or uh, Chinese New Year uh, programming or uh, different types of programming that is culturally specific. Uh, yet we've seen uh, lukewarm results. Uh, some other organizations have focused on marketing and communications, putting the uh, word out about their programs uh, in specific uh, media channels that are uh, ethnic specific. Uh, and lately, for the last few years, we've been hearing a lot about the organization's uh, cultural competence and as Francis was talking about, uh, we've been hearing about the, the diversity of the staff and board of uh, the organization itself. Yet what we know is that no one of these three factors uh, isolated has uh, produced the kind of results that we want to. So our hypothesis was that it is the combination of all these three factors that creates uh, meaningful engagement or unified uh, engagement. So with that, uh, and a couple of other hypotheses are also um, focused on the, on the experience of these visitors, uh, we did a qualitative uh, study. So we did 41 interviews with self-identified Latinos all around California uh, to uh, coastal cities and two inland uh, cities, including one rural area, which is Fresno. Uh, after the last election, there's been a lot of interest and a lot of talk about rural uh, communities and how those are oftentimes isolated from our uh, focus when we plan and when we think about art engagement. Uh, so we were very interested in hearing that point of view. Fresno, it's a mid-sized city, but most of the uh, people who live there depend on the agriculture uh, industry. So that's why we decided to go to Fresno. And uh, so what we found was that we can identify five main experiences that Latinos are looking for when they engage with the arts. And these are the experience of freedom, the experience of community, the experience of harmony, the experience of enlightenment, and the experience of beauty. Uh, we call these meaningful experiences because they are the kind of experiences that make life worth living. It's the high level uh, type of experience that uh, we all strive for and that we all want to have in our lives. You know, when we talk about experiences in the arts, oftentimes uh, there's, there's a lot of different levels of experiences that we're talking about. And a lot of people focus on the functional experience. Is the uh, ticketing uh, working? Is the light, uh, the lights are, uh, are working in the galleries? Are the ushers uh, giving the proper information? We think that it's important. But at the end of the day, what really engage people and what really make people thrive and, and, and connect with the arts experiences are these high-level uh, experiences. And what was really interesting also is that all these ex five experiences that I mentioned are tied to cultural values, to uh, things that people told us are uh, values that were transmitted by their parents, by their families, by their communities as uh, Latinos. So what we think is that by focusing on these experiences and not only on the cultural and ethnic identity of people, 
we have more uh, room, more opportunities to create uh, programs and communications that would resonate with these uh, populations. Um, so one of the things, for example, that we heard about the organization itself was that uh, it is important for uh, people, for Latinos in specific, to see that there are other uh, Latinos in the audience. There's a level of comfort that makes people feel at ease, that makes people feel connected when they see that the audience represents also their community. But at the same time, there's also an interest to see that the organization the staff also represents this uh, diversity. Uh, we heard a lot about not being, not wanting to be exclusive. They don't want an organization to be exclusively uh, Latino uh, staff, for example. They think that diversity is very important, but definitely uh, they feel that uh, Latinos should be included. Now, we also asked them whether it was important to see Latinos like themselves at the leadership levels. So in this case, we're talking about the audience. What is the audience perception of the organizational leadership? And what was really interesting was to hear people saying that having curators, producers, uh, 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 who identify as Latinos themselves, and also to see directors, leaders, and board members who also identify as, as Latinos would bring a sense of pride for themselves. A lot of the things that we heard was that it's a proof that we can do it, it's a proof that we are worth, that we are capable, and that we matter. So validation was a big, big part of the, the experience in that case, which I think is an important insight from our uh, study. Not everybody is interested. Some people couldn't uh, really uh, didn't didn't have a lot of uh, interest in the leadership of the organization. They were uh, more interested in the programs, but definitely there was a, a, a considerable portion of our interviewees that uh, would say, yes, it is important uh, for me, it makes, makes me feel proud, and it, it makes me feel validated. Um, so I would, those are the, 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 the points that I would highlight uh, right now that I think would be relevant for our audience. Obviously, we have way more uh, insight on the uh, study, and I would encourage our listeners to uh, explore the, uh, the results of the, of the study, which are published on our website. Great. Well, thank you, Salvador. Again, a nice summary of some interesting and but complicated material. Again, I, I would agree uh, our participants should go to the website and read the study carefully. But I have a few questions for you. And the first one is, a lot of cultural organizations are understaffed, under-resourced, and may want to know what are the top two or three things this study tells me. Um, number one, can you tell them that? And then I'd say, do you also want to say you can't tell them that, that it's more sophisticated than that, there aren't any two or three things? How do you approach such a question? Well, uh, what I would say is that uh, it is important to create a strategy that is unified uh, for audiences. Uh, over the years, one of the things that I've seen is that for uh, arts organizations, regardless of the size, it is really hard to create uh, uh, an, uh, an engagement strategy for specific groups on top of what they are doing. And uh, besides not having enough resources, human and, and financial, I think what is important is to start thinking about how, what, how can we unify our uh, approach to uh, audiences, meaning we know that our communities are already diverse. We know that there's uh, uh, a lot of uh, diversity, not only ethnic and cultural, but in many uh, other different ways. 
So finding the, uh, a way in which we can create like an umbrella uh, strategy that encompass this uh, diversity would be uh, successful. So that's, that's one of the things that we uh, imply, let's say, with our uh, study. And the other one is that we also need to recognize the complexity of the uh, communities that we are engaging. Uh, engaging Latinos or the Latino population is, is very diverse in itself, and it's very complex. So uh, we need to really uh, understand the local uh, community that we are working with and trying to uh, really get to, the, uh, uh, to that complexity. With this in mind, what we develop uh, on the study is what we call design principles there are uh, actionable guidelines that art organizations, regardless of their size, can use when they are designing programs or uh, communications. It could be uh, almost like a checklist that they go over and they, they, they check these high-level guidelines that would uh, help them in the, in the design of programs. Great. Well, that, that's helpful. Uh, another question for you, uh, just as I asked Francis, uh, what's next for you? What, what do you see you and your company doing with this study? And is there another study in the offing? Well, yes. Uh, what we would like to do now is to create a similar uh, study, but including other population groups. In this case, we got funding uh, to look at the Latino population, but what we would like to do is to do a study that includes uh, African American, Asians, Native Americans, uh, etc., all the, 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 the different uh, population groups, and see how these frameworks, these models that we've developed uh, work uh, for, for different population groups, where are the points of intersection as well as the uh, differences. So that's one idea. We have another idea. We also like to follow up with this study with a quantitative uh, study, having a larger um, sample that would help us to make more definitive affirmations. Great. Excellent. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn uh, to Paul Wynn, uh, the manager of the Creative Vitality Suite project, and Susan Gillespie, who is a senior associate on that project, to talk just a little bit about data uh, one can extract from the Creative Vitality Suite, then we'll go on to some questions. But Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the CBE Suite is a creative labor market tool that provides arts organizations uh, with uh, economic data uh, to inform uh, advocacy, economic development, planning, and programming. Uh, so with the tool, users can compare uh, creative activity within a region to state and national benchmarks on jobs, earnings, and other metrics. Um, users uh, can track trends across years, and most importantly, uh, they can support uh, community-rich stories and activities uh, happening locally with uh, grounded economic data. So with our recent addition of demographics data to CV Suite, we can look further below the economic data uh, at the uh, diversity within a region's workforce. Um, our dem demographic data covers uh, age, gender, race, and ethnicity. Um, it groups uh, by populations, uh, occupation jobs, and industry jobs. Uh, administrators can measure inclusive, inclusivity by comparing demographics within regions' population to jobs in the creative sector. And um, by looking at creative occupations, we can also determine you know, the underrepresented demographic groups. Uh, so you know, we encourage new and existing users to kind of explore this data set uh, within CV Suite. Susan, do you have anything to add? Oh, thanks, Paul. Um, I just want to add that um, if you have further questions about either of these studies, you can contact CB Suite at cbsuite at weststaff.org, and you'll see that on the slide. Um, for more information, and if you would like to see a demo of the tool, I will be reaching out to um, attendees of this webinar, and we can set that up, and we can answer any questions at that time. I also wanted to let you know that we will have a, um, another webinar in February. It will be Why Create a Creative District, and so we'll let you all know about that. 
But as you can see on the slides, we do have the contact information where you can read Francis's study, and that is at race2lead.org. And Salvador's study can be found at latinexperience.org, and that is L-A-T-I-N-X-P-E-R-I-E-N-C-E.org. Great. Well, thanks, Susan and Paul. And let me turn back uh, for a moment here to Francis and Salvador. Do, would you have any uh, final comments, anything you want to add to this conversation before we go to the questions? Uh, Salvador, anything? Yes. Uh, what, I, what I would say is that I think it's becoming more and more clear that there's no silver bullet when it comes to uh, diversity in the arts. We have to look at these as a, a holistic uh, challenge in which audiences, organizations, and content work together to create uh, meaningful engagement, relevant uh, engagement, also considering that our communities are in constant evolution. So it's, it's important to keep an eye always on a moving target. I just really appreciate uh, Salvador's work and, and the fact that, uh, that we need to integrate who works at our organizations, who comes to our organizations, who our audiences uh, are, and how we can have more of a seamless uh, approach on uh, diversity and race given uh, the populations we want to serve. Perfect. Well, thanks for those comments. And just a few comments from me. Um, I think we could certainly look more carefully at Francis's work uh, as we work with our emerging leaders of color and think more about how we change those attitudes and make ways for people because we actually do want to do that through that program. And then Salvador, uh, this conversation brings us something that we found. We are, West Ham is moving across town and we're cleaning out our files. And I had forgotten a study we did in the early 2000s where we looked at six different kinds of communities. Uh, I can't remember all of them, but there's a Vietnamese community, a Latino community, African American community, and a few others. And we actually talked to them and worked with them in focus groups uh, around the issue of attending uh, cultural events, what motivated them and didn't. So I'm going to resurrect that and share that with you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, again, thanks to Francis and Salvador, and we are now and also Paul and Susan. And we're now open to take questions uh, for a bit. So thank you very much. And one question we had was for Susan, if you don't mind taking this. Uh, who uses the Creative Vitality Suite and what do they use it for? Oh, thanks for asking. That's great. Um, we've had a lot of activity recently in new subscriptions. And most recently, we've had the cities of Austin, Texas, Asheville, North Carolina, Akron, Ohio subscribe, as well as economic development departments such as Thurston County, Washington. Many state arts agencies, many with certified creative districts such as Colorado Creative Industries and ArtsWA, who is in the midst of launching their creative district program, they subscribe to the tool to do things such as measure economic impact of the creative sector and how that affects the overall economy. They also compare their creative vitality to that of peer regions, and they can also and do use the tool to track year-over-year -year changes. And really, um, most used for strategic planning for their organization as well. And we are kind of talking to other groups um, universities, their arts administration departments to help devise, you know, curriculum in the area of data in the arts so that all, at all levels we understand the need for labor market data and to better understand impact and to become smarter advocates for the arts. Great. Thanks for that summary. Uh, Salvador, uh, in the area of marketing, uh, what modes of communication are, do you find Latinas are most responsive to? Well, one of the things that we saw very clear with this study was that uh, social media is uh, really driving all the uh, communication and information, and, and uh, uh, but mostly, but also very much the dialogue that Latinos do when they engage in the arts. Uh, I see social media as an extension of word of mouth, and uh, we've always known that for Latinos, the social connection, the community uh, sense is very important. 
So when you think about that, social media allows people to connect uh, on a personal level to get recommendations from their friends, from their peers, uh, from their family, uh, and that extends also to um, arts organizations. So all kinds of social media. And we also have data that shows that Latinos uh, in specific are uh, heavy users of Instagram, for example, and Snapchat. So uh, very much social media. Great. Thanks, Salvador. Now a question for uh, Sean Thomas Breitfeld, who stepped in for Francis, who had to step away. And Sean is the co-author of the Race to Lead study. So welcome, Sean. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, what roles do governing boards play in perpetuating the disparity you have identified in your study? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so I think that the data pretty clearly shows that people in the nonprofit sector, particularly folks who are already in staff roles, understand that nonprofit boards of directors are overwhelmingly white, as BoardSource's re most recent uh, survey has also reiterated. Uh, in fact, some of the board source data may indicate that boards are becoming even whiter uh, in comparison to the survey they did two years ago uh, in terms of the number of boards that are completely comprised of uh, boards of director, members of the board of directors being all white. So that is a barrier, and people who are already in nonprofit staff roles recognize uh, that that is a barrier in terms of uh, boards of directors not recognizing the talent of staff of color and not investing in that talent. And then furthermore, we've heard a lot that um, since boards of directors are essentially the people with the responsibility to hire and fire executive directors, CEOs, co-directors of nonprofits, uh, that to the extent that, those board, that the composition of the board as well as the biases of board members remain unchecked, that that also becomes a particular barrier to people of color being considered fairly for the top level jobs in nonprofit organizations. Great, thanks for that. Uh, and now a question from uh, one of our participants. Again, uh, do you have any specific suggestions for how to recruit diverse candidates for open administrative and programmatic positions? Our organization struggles to attract diverse, a diverse pool of applicants, and we don't know uh, what concrete actions we can take. So either Sean or Salvador could take this question on. Sure. So I think there are a few things that organizations may need to consider doing. Um, so one is a sort of proactively the indication that diversity is a priority for an organization. Um, you know, there is some research uh, that shows, and this is in the for-profit side, but that when uh, the recruitment materials uh, for uh, hiring companies includes a diverse representation of staff and an affirmative statement that diversity is a priority for a company, that that has an impact in terms of people of color being more uh, likely to consider applying for a job. Uh, and so I think the, the sort of assumption that um, you know, anyone would want to work for you know, every nonprofit organization, regardless of whether they, have a, they take a position on these issues of diversity, say that it's a priority uh, is mistaken. And I think that organizations really do need to affirmatively indicate to potential um, employees that this is a priority and that the organization wants to make sure that a diverse workforce can feel comfortable and valued uh, in the organization. So that's one thing that uh, organizations can do. Another thing may just be uh, recognizing that um, you know some of the elements of a um, sort of job announcement may really reflect biases as opposed to real um, criteria for the ability to do the job. And so, you know, if we think of lack of access to or more limited access to higher education, I've talked to some organizations that, uh, particularly in a human service setting, recognize that maybe an MSW or an advanced degree wasn't necessary for a job, uh, and that once they made some adjustments in terms of how they thought about structuring roles inside of the organization, then they were able to have more diverse candidates. Again, this relates to the fact that there are larger systems 
and structures that limit access for people of color to um, some of the credentials that might otherwise prepare them to uh, be considered for some jobs in our organizations, unfortunately. Great. Thank you, Sean. Salvador, anything to add to that? Yes, I completely agree uh, with what Sean said, uh, but I would add also that looking at uh, HR, at, at employment, uh, isolated from an overall view of uh, diversity uh, within the whole organization could lead also to a lot of, of troubles. Uh, candidates might be perceived as uh, filling a quota if there's no uh, overall diversity uh, strategy. So I think it is important to also uh, pay attention to create relationships uh, in general at all levels uh, with, with uh, specific communities and, uh, and learn from those communities what are the priorities and the, the needs uh, so then you have a more uh, holistic view. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, having spent time during, uh, doing research in the field, how ready do you think the field is to embrace change in these areas? And I'm going to address that. It, it was not specified who the questioner is asking, so, but, but I think it could apply to either one of you. So, Sean, do you want to start? How ready is the field to embrace change in, in this area? Um, well, I, I'm of two minds in response to this question. I think the, there is certainly a great degree of readiness given the fact that there are a lot of conversations about these issues uh, emerging and, and bubbling in the nonprofit sector. I think the challenge may be um, you know, that sort of the people with the most power to affect change may be less ready than ready to have the conversation, ready to make change than the folks who are clamoring for the change to be made. So I think that there's an imbalance in terms of who is ready to engage in the conversation and who, frankly, is willing to uh, have some, so to speak, skin in the game uh, in terms of making some shifts in the way organizations are structured and the way organizations are prioritizing addressing these issues. Salvador, anything to add? Yes. Uh, what I would add is that I agree that there's uh, much more attention and much more interest. Uh, I, I always say that 1216 uh, was the year of diversity and inclusion in the art. Lots of the major arts organizations dedicated conferences to talk about the, the topic, uh, etc. And it's uh, very much in the, in the, on the air. Yet, uh, I think that what we are missing uh, in the conversation is the matter of sustainability. Diversity is not only a matter of social justice. Uh, it's not just a matter of being uh, equitable and uh, democratic. It's also a matter of, of uh, the bottom line. And uh, if we don't address diversity in the field, uh, we are going to become irrelevant pretty soon. So we need to also look at the future and, uh, and to look at this as a matter of sustainability. And in that regard, I think we still need a lot. Uh, we still need to do a lot. Okay. Well, here's a question for you, Salvador. Um, your study talks about the needs of the Latino community as it pertains to cultural experiences. Could you tell us what some of those needs are? Yes, uh, we, we heard a wide array of, of uh, needs that we summarize in uh, some uh, areas. One of those uh, very much is the need to uh, transmit cultural values to the younger uh, generations. Uh, some others are about uh, personal enjoyment, uh, me time, uh, contemplative uh, time. Some other needs are about social connection. Uh, some other needs is uh, also around becoming a more educated person, a more well-rounded uh, person through the arts uh, experience. And what we saw is that obviously these needs are connected to the kind of experiences that people are looking for. Uh, there's uh, one need that we call validation, uh, which um, is connected 
to the recognition that uh, the community gets from other uh, communities as part of an uh, integral part of the, of the society. Uh, but that's uh, just one of, of many. It's, it's not the only one. Uh, I would say that a lot of times arts organizations focus very much on that particular part of or, or that particular need, but it's important to also know that there are all their needs that people have for the Latinos in a specific care. Thanks, Salvador. I see one last question from a participant, and it's for Sean. Uh, Sean, you note in your study that the number of people of color in executive director slash CEO roles in nonprofit organizations has remained under 20% for the last 15 years. How do these statistics compare to the for-profit leadership landscape? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, and I think the interest in comparing to the for-profit sector is certainly um, makes sense. We know from, you know, various news sources, particularly uh, the surveying that Fortune does of like Fortune 500 companies, um, that right now there are like a handful of black CEOs on the Fortune 500, right? So um, the, you know, and unfortunately uh, the sort of data isn't necessarily collected on the workforces more broadly. I think there's only say 26 organizations that actually provide information on workforce so that you can then see beyond who's in the CEO role, uh, senior leadership concentration of people of color in senior leadership roles. But sort of long story short, nonprofits and uh, for-profit, there is a lot of room uh, for improvement. I think that from the perspective of uh, a sector that is ex specifically working with and often on behalf of communities of color, the fact that there is such a big mismatch between the constituency served and who is running the organizations is a particular problem to the nonprofit sector that is not going to be as, uh, as relevant uh, in the sort of profit-seeking side of the, of, you know, the workforce. Um, and you know, I think the other thing, so there is really, I think we don't want to lose sight of the, um, the moral element given sort of that nonprofit organizations largely serve communities and often serve communities that don't look like the people who are in charge of those organizations. And so while it is a broader problem in the workforce more you know, overall, uh, I think there is a particular need uh, to, for the nonprofit sector to take these issues very seriously. Great, well thank you, Sean, for that answer. And with that, we are gonna wrap for the uh, hour. Don't want to keep you any longer, although we have a couple of lingering questions, but we better sign off so you can get all get back to work like we need to get back to work. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Sean for stepping in for Francis, and also thank you, too, for your great work on the study as co-author. So we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Salvador, and thank you also for your great work on the study. Thank you to the Creative Vitality Suite team. Paul Wynn and Susan Gillespie, and I think I thank everyone now, but I, I really think we're seeing some rising uh, data research in this field that's going to help us all get to eventually where we want to go. It's a long road, but this is all very helpful. Thanks to all of you, and thanks for our, to our participants. We will have another webinar after the first of the year dealing with cultural districts and data. We'll be notifying everyone about that in the very near future. Thanks for joining us.